throughout history, man has always created works of art. From early rock murals to iconic sculptures to timeless paintings capturing human beauty and design. In more recent history, we've managed to turn just about anything into art. One, two, three, four, get my shoes and out the door. Five, if you can five, touch it or seven, see it, great. someone has used it. Over time, visual art has been classified in diverse ways. Liberal arts, mechanical arts, fine arts, including architecture, dance, sculpture, music, painting, poetry, film, photography, and comics. We'd even expanded our thinking to consider including fashion, computer art, performance, advertising, animation, television, and video games. Many would even consider sports to be an expression of art. Whether created by inspiration or created to inspire, art exists for us and is a manifestation of human and some say divine creativity. But what about words? Could words be considered art? Not just any words, but words deliberately spoken and expressed to inspire. And if so, who are these gifted composers and artists of the spoken word? Many have fame and money, but success is one thing, impact is another. Just a little bit, move to be free To keep my head up, don't forget to be me Like I want a million dollars, like I get to pay dirt Gonna stop for me to hear the kind of My name is Evan Money Yes, my last name really is Money But I wasn't born with any in my teen years, my mom, along with my brother and I, lived inside this exact garage. Not long after, I landed my first real job in the sales profession. After six months of struggle, the top salesman handed me this, a pirated cassette tape of a man named Jim Rohn. That was when I first discovered the power words of art could have and their true impact. As my success skyrocketed, I could always point back to the words of art that impacted and inspired me to greatness. Words from key thought leaders, pastors, authors. I then realized that our nation's successes and other nations' most pivotal moments have been directed by words of art. Now, 20 years from the time I listened to my first words of art masterpiece, I will set out and travel the country interviewing the greatest speakers, thought leaders, and artists of our time. Perhaps the most impactful and famous words ever spoken in U.S. history, one that sent ripples through the world, I Have a Dream by Dr. Martin Luther King. To explore this more, I visited with Dr. Goody Goodlow, a specialist in the history of Martin Luther King Jr. Is the spoken word itself unartful? Words are, are powerful expressions of, of the human narrative. Uh, wars have been started by words. Wars have been ended by words. You know, when you're talking about an art form and, and the power of words, and, and I think Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr. is is probably one of those people who who is probably at the zenith of, of that particular art form. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. He used words to speak to the conscience of a nation. See, when Dr. King uttered those words, it wasn't just, I have a dream, that March on Washington were for jobs and equality. So I have a dream was just an expression of a larger narrative. And so even in the art form of a spoken word or words that are expressed, I think you have to go beyond, 
you know, the initial connotation of the word or, in a, in, or what, is the, what is the total characterization of that expression? But I think for that time in our history that no other person uh, was able to speak with such clarity, moral clarity, to the conscience of our nation to the extent of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. The impact of the words, I have a dream, coming from those humble beginnings mm -hmm. to being a doctor now, mm -hmm. could we attribute that specifically to those words of art? I make no bones about that. I, obviously, you know, there are other people who influenced my life. But yeah, Dr. King's life, his legacy. I remember as a young kid in junior high school, sending off, there was a little sheet, application sheet, you could go through and check off the speeches that you wanted to purchase. And you would put your little money order, your check, and they would send you in turn uh, copies of his sermons or his speeches. And so I can still remember they were white with red writing. And I can remember, I tell people, I not only listen to Dougie Fresh and Run DMC and, you know, you know, Salt and Pepper, but I can remember putting the cassette tapes and falling asleep listening to Dr. King's speeches. And so absolutely, of course, he's one of uh, many people, but probably ranks up there with probably one of the most significant. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view, but we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom. The last nail is being driven into the coffin of the American Republic, yet Congress remains in total denial as our liberties are rapidly fading before our eyes. We must declare with one voice that women's progress is human progress, and human progress is women's progress once and for all. Those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside. How do you think politics are shaped by the spoken word? To say that politics are influenced by the spoken word is a huge understatement. Everything in politics depends on the words people say, all the way from the constituents, just the regular everyday people like myself, to the senators, the congressmen, all the way up to the president, right? Everything that we say shapes politics. The path we offer may be harder, but it leads to a better place. And I'm asking you to choose that future. I'm asking you to rally. There's a saying here in DC that perception is reality. And you hear that a lot. And so I think a lot of times people are quick to come out with something to say. Sometimes, again, it's true, sometimes it's not. <laughs> but I think there's always a, an aggressive strategy to try to put out a message and to, to try to shape the message. And a lot of times that comes through the spoken word. Sometimes it's the written word but it's always trying to shape the dialogue, trying to shape the argument, trying to shape the debate. Read my lips. No new taxes. If you're trying to reach a constituent base uh, who will vote you into office, the spoken word is the most powerful, hmm. I would, I believe. I mean, if you look at history, um, at speeches, you know, Winston Churchill, Abe Lincoln, Martin Luther King, whoever, the, it's the spoken word that you remember. And this is a city where words are parsed very closely. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, an inflection in a word or in a sentence or at the end of a statement can totally change the, the meaning of a sentence or a, or a message. And so I think there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time, uh, both here on the hill and down the street, that examine those words really closely and parse those words very closely before anybody says them from a teleprompter or from a, a speech uh, podium. Uh, they're examined really closely. So when you're writing those words, Every word, are you thinking the positive and negative possible yeah. effect of each word? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's, and there's usually teams of people that are in the room once the speech has been written or the talking points have been written, and you kind of debate those things out because, especially in the media, uh, you know, they'll take, they can take a five minute speech or a 10 minute speech and reduce it down to 10 seconds. And so you've got to make sure that 
every single word that you're saying is, uh, is going to come across. It can stand on its own. That I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. Do some of them not keep their promises? Absolutely, right? Um, there's, there's partisan politics, and that plays a big part. But I think that there's a lot of good, good happening out of Washington, D.C., and out of the many state capitals across the nation. I think there's positive changes, and those words that are spoken um, by those politicians are, are making some good changes happen. Do you think it was the words or the, the delivery? Oh, it's a combination. It's absolutely a combination. I always say you can't um, be impact impactful with just words alone, right? And you can't be impactful just as a great speaker. Um, you really need a great combination. As a writer, people always say, you have a way with words. Not really, you know? I put words together, but it's what's behind the words. It's because they're great speakers, but they had a great message. It was both put together. Sometimes on the news, the weather person will announce that we're under a flash flood warning. That means conditions are right for possible flooding. It could overflow and increase in such a way that drainage and bayous are overwhelmed. Just like that weather person, I'm here to announce to you today, you're under a flash flood warning. Conditions are just right. You've honored God, you've been faithful, you passed the test. Now God is saying there's about to be a flood, but not with water. You're going to see a flood of my goodness, a flood of opportunity, a flood of healing, a flood of good grace. In your lifetime, what have been some of the most impactful words that have been spoken to you? You know, I think looking back as a child, probably some of the most impactful words or my parents, just simple things like, I'm proud of you. And, you know, Joel, you're gonna do great things in life. And just those, you know, they seem very simple, but, uh, you know, those words stick with you. And so I still, I can still hear my parents saying that. God would not let you have the breath to breathe if you were all done. Somebody needs your encouragement. Somebody needs your gifts. In your experience, Joel, how powerful truly is the spoken word? I think it's incredibly powerful. I think you're prophesying your future. You're predicting what's going to happen. And it seems to me like I see a lot of people that don't realize it and they speak negative things over their life. And so that's why part of our message is, you know, be careful what you say. It's not time to retire. It's time to refire. You need to get ready. God is going to give you new opportunities and more time to share your gift with the world. You can't go around saying, I'm never gonna get any good breaks, and I'm so slow, and I'm so clumsy, and expect to live a victorious life. I say it like this, you can't talk defeat and expect to have victory. You can't talk, you know, lack and expect to have abundance. So you gotta speak, you know what, that I'm well able, that I can do all things, and things like that. Now my encouragement, get up every morning and say, Father, Thank you for this flood of favor in my life. Then go out expecting it. If you do that, I believe and declare you're going to see God's goodness overwhelm you. Get ready for it. It's headed your way. If you receive it, can you say amen today? God's omniscience doesn't compute in our logical left brains, or it doesn't make sense to us. But here's what I've learned. When you get into an argument with God, if you win that argument, you lose. And if you lose that argument, you win. When I was a teenager, one day I just, I heard this speaker that I was really drawn to just the way he communicated. And, and afterwards, uh, it was in a church setting, and I was just praying. He came and put his hand on my shoulder and he literally said, God is gonna use you in a great way. I mean, those aren't, those aren't unique words, different words. And someone else could have said that, you know, to me at a different place at a, in a different time. But there was something about that moment that uh, it was in the context of prayer that began to kind of declare the promises of God and the purposes of God and the plan of God. I'm someone that is really kind of a simpleton. I just think that the people that God uses the most are the people that spend the most time with Him. Because I think that's who He can trust the most. 
I think the most impactful words that we hear usually have less to do with the words themselves and the state of mind or state of emotion that we're in. So if we're in a place where we're feeling very insecure, I mean, if someone speaks a word of encouragement, those words carry far more weight and almost become unforgettable. The, the spoken word then becomes an art form. I mean, think about Jesus uh, and the parables. Most of them are less than 250 words, and so very short kind of word pictures. But you hear them once, and you'll never forget them. That's brilliance. That, that's an ability to take the spoken word, find a metaphor. And so as a writer and as a speaker, I mean, I'm always looking for the metaphor. I just think we ought to be more known for what we're for than what we're against. We gotta beat the enemy at his own game, and that means we need to be shrewd as snakes. I think the metaphor is where it's at. Um, it, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional truth bomb that uh, when, when you find the right metaphor, I, I think then you're creating art in a sense um, that allows people not just to hear the truth, but to see it and feel it and uh, and that's where the best communicators have the ability to do that. You don't just hear it, you feel it, you see it, and, uh, and that's when the spoken word becomes art. Somebody asked me one time if I had a good description of life. I said, yes, I think I've got a good one. Life is the struggle to keep death at a respectable distance. Read your audience. If you're talking to a child, you got to study the face of the child. You got to study a little body language. You got to study what's going on. So you'll know whether to shift gears, come on a little stronger, ease off a little, might be too strong. Search for another illustration. Soft, strong. A lot of that is dictated by reading your audience. Jim was an open person, and most people didn't realize this. You're, you can approach Jim. You can approach him, and he's very approachable. And this, to me, is, is what life is about. So he lived his life. What are some of your favorite words of art from Jim? Jim would always say, you have to get good at planting in the springtime or you go begging in the fall. So that was who he was. And now there's a sense of urgency here. Here's why. Spring doesn't last that long. To be able to say, I just got back, doesn't last that long. It's called the springtime of opportunity. Postpone a few things in the springtime, get the job done. Set aside a few things in the springtime, get the job done. When I first met Jim, it was an accident meeting. Uh, I was there to meet with the seminar promoter, and I walked into the, to the room. The event wasn't over, so I sat at the back of the room waiting for it to be over, and Jim was at the front of the room, and I'm like, who's this slight, wispy, gray-haired guy with this weird-sounding voice? And he asked the question to the audience. He said, you know, how many people here want to have more? And I thought, yeah. I and so I'm thinking, okay, what do I got to do now? Because I was successful at the time, but I had done it just through brute force. I mean, just out working, out failing, out prospecting you know, everybody else around me, just working everybody else under the table, right? So 14, 16 hours a day, it's like, I don't have the capacity to do anything more, but go ahead, tell me what I got to do now. <laughs> and he said, you know, if you want to have more, you want to become more. Major question to ask on the job is not, what am I getting here? That's not the major question. The major question to ask is, what am I becoming here? It's not what you get that makes you valuable, it's what you become that makes you valuable. You know, success is, uh, is not something you pursue. What you pursue eludes you. It could be like chasing butterflies. Success is something you attract by the person you become. You know, Jim had that way of just putting it on, on you. You know, for, for, for things to improve, you have to improve. For things to grow, you have to grow. And, and those words um, started to refine this idea of knowing what it really is to be 100% responsible for your life. Several years ago, I was on one of the national news programs. He said, Zig, you go all over the country talking about positive thinking, making money, going to the top. He said, you're so positive, you think you could whip Mohammed Ali? 
Well, folks, that's dumb, even though I fought in the ring two years. And it's a matter of record, just for your information, that the worst I ever finished was second. <laughs> but Dad just, he, he had just an incredible way of communicating what you needed to hear or what anybody needed to hear. When he was just getting started in speaking, he was in the men's room getting ready, and nobody recognized him back then. This is probably late 60s. And these two guys walk in, and one of them said, hey, have you ever heard of Zig Ziglar? And the other one said, no, I haven't. And the first guy said, man, Zig is the funniest speaker you've ever heard. Well, most people who would hear that conversation in the background would think, oh, that's a compliment. Dad left there, and he made a decision. He decided this, do I want to be known as the funny speaker or the life-changing speaker? And that day, he put humor in its right place, not as the emphasis to get applause and to get recognition, but as a tool to help people understand what they're designed for, the way God made them, so that they could become all they could be. The purpose of Strategies for Success is to share with you how do we discover the oil, how do we bring it to the surface, how do we take it to the marketplace, how can we learn to be so that we can do and do so that we can have. I mean, would you say the spoken word is a legitimate art form? The spoken word is an art form. And the reason I know that is because I've seen people's hearts and souls moved just in the way you phrase something. I've seen people not moved at all when something is phrased incorrectly. And so what's the difference in those two things? Well, it's tonality, it's intent, it's motive. It's all the things that make good art. And Dad's, you know, what he did is he inspired hope. I mean, that was his number one goal when he went on stage, was to give people hope. You see, you will have started to change from a fault finder to a good finder. Some people do really find fault like there's a reward for it. They really do. He knew that if people had hope, they would take the next step. Like he said, a child who knew that they had no hope of passing the test wouldn't even study. I studied Dad for a long time, many years, uh, trying to figure out how come when he spoke, people took action. And so I realized that he had a formula. That's why he was able to impact so many lives. He gave hope. People identified with him and his story. They tried it for 30% longer, they got results. They realized that he was broken, that he gave all the credit to God. And then of course the last one is love, is he would get on stage and he would love people. And when people saw that message communicated in love, it would change everything. During the glory years, the, the icons, you, Zig, Jim Rohn. Right. You guys did a tour together. Yep. You know, Zig was kind of the headliner, and Jim Rohn was kind of the, the quiet one, and Art Linkletter was, you know, the broadcast guy, and Norman Vincent Peale was the clergy guy, and Paul Harvey was the broadcaster guy, and Earl Nightingale was the strangest secret guy, and we did the positive thinking rallies. So we went to a big tour of Australia, Zig and Jim Rohn and I and a, a group, and when we were in uh, Queensland, Zig, of course, didn't know where we were going, didn't know who the, the promoter was, and just went along for the ride. So we played a trick on him, and Jim Rohn and I got off the plane, and we sneaked on in the back, because at that time you could sneak on the back. There were two doors in the, in the old days. So we hid in the back, reading a newspaper, and Zig says, uh, I'm sorry, we can't go now. My two friends went to, went to the restroom and they're not back. And they said, sorry, we have to go. They pulled the ramp and went and he said, no, no, you don't understand. I don't know where we're going. I don't know what the next city is. They said, the next city is Townsville, sir. Just get off there and call your party. He said, I don't know who to call. I don't have a phone number. And they wouldn't do that. <laughs> and so he walked back and said, why do you guys always do that? So we love to play practical jokes on each other. Who are some of your favorite words of art from? I'd have to say my grandmother, because my grandmother and I, during World War II, planted victory gardens. And we planted seeds in the soil, and they came up just like what was on the package. I couldn't believe it. I said, how do you know it's going to look like that? She said, whatever you put in the soil. And I want you to plant great ideas from people who've been really good in service. 
you become what you do. So make sure you model yourself after the seeds of greatness. You were originally famous for your work with the Olympics. How important were the actual words as far as sports psychology goes? The, the whole idea of psycholinguistics, the language of the mind, is fundamentally important to Olympic. So let's say that you're, you're going for the vault, you need a 9.95 to tie the Romanian for the <laughs> woman's all around gold. What do you say to yourself when you're standing there in front of a billion viewers? Do you say, why me? A bronze isn't so bad, I wish my parents weren't here, I'm getting sick to my stomach. The Romanians are better trained, maybe they're on steroids. Would you say that or would you say, this is your moment in history, just like drill? Mm. Speed, power, explode, extend, rotate, plant the feet at the end. When the pressure's on, I get better. Need a 10, got a 10, let's go. So the trigger words, the affirmative words, there's a lot more to affirmations than just looking in the mirror saying, uh, I'm rich, I'm wonderful. Uh, you really need to talk to yourself with all due respect. And so. Words are very powerful, especially in our society where sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Oh, yes, they will. Mm -hmm. Words can be very powerful healers and slayers. So I think they are, you can have words of art. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Josh Schiff. I can make fun of nerds because I am one. Sometimes nerds get mad, they're like, me. <laughs> Stop making fun of me, I will edit your Wikipedia page. Josh Ship, 85-year-old Japanese woman. And I won't hook you up on Farmville. It's really can be a competitive sport and an art speaking to, you know, high school teenage audience because that you know whether it's working or not. I don't want to like give you some sort of like cheesy, unrealistic motivational speech like be the best. Be the best. I don't know why I'm bending my knees like that. That's <laughs> like, you, you know, you've heard this, but oh, be the best. What? Shut up. You have to earn the right to become good. You know, you, and it, it, it takes a lot of time. It takes a, a lot of not doing well to do, to do well. I'm not asking you to be the best. I think that's cheesy. I think that's unrealistic. What I am asking you to do is be your best. So Josh, I'm assuming you would agree that the spoken word is an art form. You know, for me, what I do as a speaker, I think of speaking as an art, you know, partially an art, partially a science, but really that art of it is what fascinates me. You know, those subtleties, the ability to shift certain things, to take a sentence from seven words to five, and it has more punch or it's funnier. She's like Martha Stewart on Red Bull <laughs> with a Glock. I'm not, you know, I don't want to be a comedian, but I have to earn the right to be heard. And with high school kids, you know, who are skeptical, who, you know, these guys are shoved in an auditorium against their will. And it's like, listen to this guy. And so that part is fun for me to see the kids go from like this to, hmm, you know, this is interesting, this is engaging, this isn't what I expected. So, okay, I'll give you a shot. Success is not about perfection, success is about your willingness. Are you willing to dedicate? yourself to things that are difficult, challenging, but worth it. What have been the most impactful words that were ever spoken to you? Hmm. It's not that the words were incredible, rhymed, or were brilliantly artistically packaged. Is that they were meaningful, authentic, at a time where my ears were open. So I think about, you know, when I went to jail and kind of had my rock bottom moment. And then my foster parents brought me back to the, their little living room. They said, Josh, we don't see you as a problem, we see you as an opportunity. They had probably said that dozens of times. The difference was I had hit a rock bottom moment. I was face to face with my own stupidity and stupid choices. And I was willing to listen to something. Uh, so that, you know, Josh, we don't see you as a problem. 
we see you as an opportunity. You're not a problem, you're an opportunity. You don't have to allow this stuff to own you. It's an opportunity. That was without question a life-changing moment for me. What do you think the most impactful words that you've ever spoken were? You know, I've gone through all this stuff. I have a story to tell, and I need to have the guts, the courage to tell it. And the cool thing is you never know, like, something I said in there today, for some kids it was like, yeah, it's an interesting idea. But for a couple kids it's like, they have had a rock bottom moment. They have had some sort of thing happen in their life where they're more open to new ideas, to being influenced, inspired. I remember one of the handful of first times I shared my story, this kid came up to me, a young woman. She hands me notes, says, thanks, I don't need this anymore. I stick it in my back pocket and I'm like, whatever, she, you know, I'm like 18, she probably thinks I'm cute. Want me to go to the prom with her or something. Get out to the parking lot, digging through my stuff, trying to find directions. Open it up, it's her suicide note. No joke. I remember I just like put the car in park and I'm like, holy crap. This is, this is game changing. This is no longer, I'm a monkey on a stage trying to like entertain people. But something I said from an authentic standpoint, connected with this young lady at a time where she was vulnerable at a critical stage in her life, and somehow it made a difference. It means this, once you don't talk out, you act out. Once you do not talk out, you act out. Go find some caring adult, I don't care who it is, and say, hey, there are a few things I need to get off my chest. I think the most important message I have to bear in high schools, you know, around the world, is no one's perfect. Everyone's a little bit screwed up. Everyone's a little bit scared. Don't think you're alone. It's okay. Find a caring adult. They'll understand. about the spoken word, it has the chance to illuminate. It has the power to give life. The spoken word, as a speaker, as a publisher, as an author, I think it's the highest form of art. There has never been more opportune times in human history for the budding entrepreneur than right here, right now. What do successful people and unsuccessful people have in common? They both hate to do what it takes to be successful. But successful people do it anyway. For you personally, the most impactful words that were ever spoken to you? I was 18 years old. I had gone to a friend of mine's house. He had called me all excited and said, you know, my brother just came back from San Diego and he's got this video. He's really excited about this. So I go over there and lo and behold, it ends up becoming a pitch for um, uh, this water filter business, and I'm the only guy in the room that had saved enough money at 18 years old to buy $5,000 worth of it, so I bought the $5,000 worth of it on the spot. It shows up at my, I'm still living at home, at, in, at, to my dad's garage, and he drives home, can't get his car in the garage because it's stacked with all these water filters, and he comes in the house kind of in a fit about it, and he says, what the hell is going on, and you know, what the hell is that? Those weren't the influential words, by the way. <laughs> That's common dialogue okay, in our household. Okay. And I said, well, I ordered these filters, they showed up, and I, you know, and he's, and I, I don't know whether I, I'm supposed to sell them. I, I don't know who I'm gonna sell them to or what I'm gonna do. And he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, you can do it. Those are the most poignant words ever spoken to me. By my dad, instead of being angered, which I thought he would be, mm. he saw this as like a great opportunity for me to learn life. And he wanted me to know that he believed I could do it. And I borrowed that belief and I didn't want to let him down. And that's what gave me the courage as well as the persistence and the dedication. And I just went door to door. I, I, I sold all 40 water filters. I ordered another 5,000. I sold those again. And it really was the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. Because as soon as I found that I could do it, because he believed that I could. Mm. And I wanted to continue to prove to him that I could, that I could, that I could. That led to another, led to another, led to me standing here right now today. And if he mm. hadn't said those words, 
I don't know that I'd be here. Our main message is through all the ugly, heinous, nasty things that you're surrounded with, there is at least one beacon of hope and opportunity. There's one place where you could see people doing amazing, wonderful, miraculous things, overcoming great odds and still doing life-changing things in the world. And you'll find their example and you'll learn how they do it. And that's what we want to present to you inside the pages of success. In, in your business, Success Magazines, what do you want your impact to be? Some speakers speak to entertain, to, you know, squeeze your heart. That's not me. Some speakers speak to motivate or inspire. That's not me. I speak to get results. And whatever it's going to take for you and I to get you a result, that's what I'm after. So if we have to skip the entertainment and I need to, to, to take out the tear-jerking stories so that we can get to the business of helping you achieve the objectives that you've got for your life, that's where we're going to go. Now, if what we do together inspires and motivates you, great, but that's secondary. What we're after is getting a result. So I want my legacy to be, this guy helped me get results. Most everybody that comes to hear me speak is coming looking for hope. I teach people to make more money, how to be a better person, how to be more valuable, and to make more money and take care of their family. So they walked in the room, maybe they were saying he, he's not, or I'm going to shoot holes in him, so you have to first disarm him. I use humor a lot, a lot in my talks. After you disarm him a little bit with humor and make friends with that person in the audience, then your job's to deliver what he came for, which is hope. It helped me recognize the first annual winner of the Co-Founders Impact Award, founding national consultant, Mr. Steve Thompson. So when you're around a group and you're wanting to inspire them, do you specifically craft your words of art? Are you conscious of, hey, if I say it in this word, this way, I can Absolutely. get them to do... Absolutely. I mean, the, the biggest thing I tell myself, right before I go on stage, I, I think to myself, I have a chance, one chance only right now to move some people. There's somebody out there that needs this way more than I could even be prepared for, way more than I could be scared. So regardless of what happens, I'm going to see if I can reach out to that person and move them. And i got to remember my, my biggest drive is positive statements or asking positive questions. Those words are, have got to be well chosen. I think experience helps with that. Every once in a while I say something that I wish I could suck back in, but most of the time experience filters out mm -hmm. the things that, you know, there's things that come to your mind and you, your, your guard says, that could come out a little negative. That might bring someone down in here. How do you decide what words you're gonna fit in where? I mean, is there a specific spot? I think about it um, all the time. I think about it all the time and when I'm reading and watching and, and particularly, you know, I'm, the, I'm that old adage, if you steal from one person, you're a plagiarist and if you steal from everybody, you're a researcher. And I'm a great researcher. <laughs> so I, I look for anyone that I can grab some positive thought or way to twist something that'll make people feel better about it. You know, everybody's got the same paints and the same canvas. It's how you put them together. It's not just the words. It's the space between the words. How critical do you think are words as an art form when it comes to influencing someone in a positive way? It sounds corny, but I take every time somebody introduces me, I don't matter if a group's 30, 40, 50 people, when they introduce me, I try and tell myself right before I grow up, this is it. There's people out there in desperate need and, and I get to touch them right now, I have this chance. And all my focus is always on helping people around me. I learned that years ago, was blessed with that. I have failed my way to the top. I almost get up every day saying, wow, I've got to go out and talk to some people so they can tell me no and laugh at me and point out all the ways that this won't work because I know that's the path to success, you know. And, like, you cannot succeed your way to success. You have to fail your way to success. Yet it's not really failure as long as you get up and learn from the experience and go again. So those things just constantly drive 
my life. And then you end up using them in your talks because you want to make sure it drives their life too. With social media, a single phrase, a single word, a single speech can transform the world today. And that's the power of social media. So understanding how words can then be shared with the world is absolutely the most powerful thing. There has never been a better time for someone who has a message that they want to share with the world because there are so many great creative ways to get it out there. Um, I think it has a whole lot to do with being on the zeitgeist and paying attention to what's going on and leveraging the power of our culture right now to disseminate a message. And how does somebody who has this little precious message, where do they start? What's the first step that they can take to start to share that and see if it grows? Because good ideas grow on their own. They attract an audience. And the way to start that at this incredible time in history is to set up a public figure page on Facebook. I'm not kidding. And start writing about what's in your heart. In the social media world we're in now, and I know that's a big part of your industry, do you think that makes words more valuable or less valuable? Well, it certainly is a spoken word out there immediately, as opposed to waiting for the 10 o'clock news. It makes you think about the message that you're trying to parlay, because in many instances in social media, you have, what, 140 characters or less in which to make an impactful statement to get people's attention. I think it's very important for people to pay attention to the things that they say, the things that they put out there. And I think a lot of celebrities are a prime example. A lot of the things that they tweet that many times they end up retracting because they are having a spontaneous moment and they've tweeted something that maybe they should have thought about or shouldn't have said at all. Think of yourself on the top of a mountain, speaking to millions of people, what would you say? That's the question we all need to ask ourselves, what would we say? Social media is the mountain. The people are at the bottom of the mountain and you're the person at the top. When you speak, the masses can hear it. And I think that all of us, everyone listening here, everybody that we interact with on a daily basis has the power to be the person at the top of the mountain with social media. In my world, the goal of music is to elicit an emotion, a reaction. Whatever emotion needs to be drawn out, that's my job, is to, to help draw that out for the listener to have a, a greater experience. So that can happen through a lyric and a song, but it can happen through an instrumental piece of music. People can hear a piece of music and they can start to cry, they can start to hear something, or they might hear a certain lyric that reminds them. I mean, one of the biggest artists of the last mm, couple years has been Adele. And what she's singing about. She's singing about girl meets boy, boy no longer likes girl, and girl is heartbroken, right? Not a new subject, not a new, you know? I mean, hundreds of songs have been written about this topic, and she just did it in a way that was unique and relatable, right? She has an amazing voice, but so many songs have been written about this topic, so why did that resonate so well with people? Because she had an ability to artfully put those words together so that they had maximum impact. So that when she can talk about, you know, um, um, I couldn't stay away, I couldn't fight it, you know. You know, she shows up at the wedding, right? Even though she's uninvited. So she could have said like, I'm a bit psychotic, I'm going nuts and I'm stalking you, right? No, but in, in couple lines of dialogue, she can communicate so you can understand, you can relate. And anybody that's been in that position of loving someone who no longer loves them, you know, it resonates. And so millions of people have resonated with this. So one, two, three. Free, 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 free. That's the, the craft of a great lyric is to be able to communicate something so efficiently. It's much harder to say something powerful in a shorter way than it. most of us like to take a long time to say something. But the shorter we can say it in, the more impactful it is. And you know, some of our favorite speakers are, have that ability to 
in a couple words, say something that could change your life, that can stay with you when you're at a point of decision or indecision, that that can come and, and really affect you. Set me free. Where does that art come from? You know, what is your source? Um, well, one of the interesting things, it's sort of a, a blessing and a curse of my business, is the deadline. But uh, if it wasn't for the deadline, there wouldn't be a lot of pieces of music getting written. So it, it really does help to define, I have this amount of time and I have to have something, so I better get to it. So as funny as that is, the deadline really motivates and is a source of inspiration. <laughs> because if you don't meet that deadline, you don't get an opportunity to meet another one. I believe in me. I believe in me. It's a very cool experience knowing, and a cool medium that, you know, I mean, there's projects that I do that air on 65 countries that people will see for, you know, maybe generations. And so it's, it's cool to be, be part of that. So it's, it, it's inspiring. And, and with music, how it can emotionally impact somebody so that, you know, a, per, a person can really be changed. Their perspectives can be changed. Their, um, their values can be changed. And so it's a powerful medium. And so when you get to use it in a positive way, it's incredibly, incredibly rewarding. My passion is in the message. I know how powerful words are. So when I was a kid growing up, I was influenced by music, and I was always a good kid, pretty much. My parents always, always did good things, but when I hear the music, sometimes it, it makes you want to do stuff you shouldn't be doing. My message in my music is to be yourself, just be you. You don't have to be like him, her, and the other. You don't have to be like me. So like, that's the whole message behind my music. I used to say it's all positive music, but it's not all positive because life's not positive, right? Life is life. It's positive, it's negative. This is how far you can call me Dylan. Let bygone be bygone. I'm rapping to the pylon. I rap because I feel like that's the easiest way to get my message through, right? If I rap, I put out one album and it sells a bunch of copies and I never release another album again, I'll write books for the rest of my life. But it has to be, I have to get my music out some way because I know it's gonna reach the masses. When you're writing your words of art, you know, when you're actually doing your craft, you know, where are you exactly? What are you doing? For the most part, the most motivation is right here because there's so much space. So I usually a park, if sometimes I'll sit in my car, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll keep a blanket like in my trunk because sometimes I'll pull up to the beach, lay the blanket out, get my notebook and just write. Mm -hmm. Take, leave my phone in the car, get out there and just write. Sometimes I'll just sit, sometimes I'll work out. But majority of the time, I'm just sitting down and I, I, I love to write at the beach. This is like my most motivational place. What were some of your favorite words of art that have shaped you along your journey? So, ever since I was little, my dad always said, you the man, he always says, no matter what it was. He called me Rock, I'm the rock of the family. Hey Rock, you the man. Mm -hmm. And now I, I do that to my nephews, mm -hmm. but it's all right here. I feed you that you're the man, now for sure you'll become the man. Right? You grow into it because it's all in your head, right? So that's like the first thing I can remember that, that, that really helped me throughout my life, right? So just having that support, that's like, that's words of art to me mm. outside of the music. And all I need is a chance. My mind fixed on this goal. Got to figure out which way to go. On this lonely road, invest all my money in this music. It's my only passion. It used to be basketball. I was only good at passing, so coach didn't push for me. Plus, I wasn't from there. But won two championships. Got the job done there. Stood out like a sore thumb. Cause from where I come from, it's rap books in your backpack, bullets in your firearm, how to learn to avoid that. Maneuver through my peers, and I used to talk to Jesus, but Lucifer was there. Even if I was scared, I would never show. Wrote my pain in my notebooks, so you would never know it. Rap my way through high school, ripped all of my opponents, had girls on my jock now. And that was like a bonus. I used to be a crump dancer back when I was a fad, paint my face and all that, like I wasn't doing bad. And when I went out to dance, it would get rid of the pain, all the pain that I covered when I put paint on my face. See, I had problems at home, 
like all of the time. And even though they were small, they were stuck in my mind. Just my parents back and forth. Mom wanted a Porsche. How was I going to get it? So I started writing and spitting the way that I'm living. It was far away from lavish. And them songs that I was writing was nothing like Lenny Kravitz. Any penny I saw grabbing. If I could reach it, I had it. Cause I was in the liquor store with my dad buying up scratches. Praying that I was scratching with the penny I was grasping. Keeping hope alive, hoping that it was a prize. And if it did, I'm surprised. Go back and double up. Scratch it with my eyes closed. And then I'd open up because I felt like we was balling if we won like seven bucks. Watching Seventh Heaven after school and lacing loose in my chucks. <laughs> It might be the lemon in a child's laughter, or the coral in the way your best friend's fiance looks at her, or the magenta in a dancer's freedom. It might even be the gray in the 67th pause you have had to take when someone asks you how you are. But the first time you realize you're not actually happy, you won't know how to admit it even if you wanted to. You will build a traffic of excuses to blame it on, will drive conversations quicker to keep your eyes from giving the secret away. You will tell yourself this ebony will lift once you finally get some sleep. But mostly, you will replay whatever black and white film is in your mind stock, searching for where you left yourself. And you will stay there for as long as you let yourself. But being a spoken word artist has actually, I think, changed kind of the venue of poetry a little bit and um, the idea of, you know, getting known, being a celebrity when it comes to, to poetry has changed a lot more. And you saw that definitely with Death Poetry Jam on HBO about, like, in the late 90s. Um, and that really brought poetry and the perf art of performance poetry to a lot of people's minds because it take, essentially merged, you know, the beat poetry movement with the rise of hip hop, um, and then some of the classic, you know, metaphor and simile and, and imagery, classic tools of poetry, and merged it all together into this like brand new, you know, art and brand new form that all of a sudden became way more accessible and almost cool. And so, with spoken word, you see like the cool of poetry. That when we stop driving our lives so fast, we can roll down the windows of our eyes, dip our hands into the harvest and remember that all of it, all of it has always been a gift. One of the sad things with, with spoken word I think right now is, although it's great that it's so accessible to so many people, um, in some ways because it's so accessible the idea of it as an art has become a little bit compromised. Mm. Um, because spoken word is performance poetry. It's just a poem being performed. And sometimes people can get so stuck on the performance part that they forget the art of words, literally, and, and how important it is to craft words. Is the vocabulary the art? Is it, you know, the cadence, the stage presence, how you put it together? How do all those three mix? You can tell when a poet does not um, connect to their own poem and there's not a lot of truth in it. And you can see the moments for poets and the really like the most powerful poets that I know and the times when I feel most powerful on stage is when I'm almost forgetting about where I am and the people in front of me because all I can do is think about the truth of the poem. And yes, there's an art in the, um, in the, in the rehearsal of it, in the preparation, but there's a moment when you show up in a poem and that is artistic and beautiful and inspirational to watch. Those are the poems that I'm just, I'm for it, I'm in, and nothing else matters. Where are you when you get these words of art, and then how exactly do you shape them and form them mm -hmm. and then craft them? Or how does that work for Danielle? Well, the first thing you have to do is you just pay attention. You just have to pay attention to how you feel and what you think. And it's almost this like metacognition um, that you have to kind of take part in and you have to start observing the world around you. And I remember one time I was really anxious because it was a 65 mile an hour speed limit zone and everyone was going 60 and I was so frustrated because I was like, why are we not going the speed limit? And so I was just observing the feeling of anxiety and that ended up um, becoming one of my favorite lines in this poem um, where I talk about trying to save the space for my dad. I don't remember the day that you left. I just remember more room to play hide and seek in mom's closet. And you were not my first choice for a poem, but since I started calling God father, I found it's really hard to get to know him when the word dad is as strange to my tongue as awkward words like ointment and moisture. 
I avoid those words at all costs. And I don't remember the day that you left. But on the day I learned you wouldn't be returning, I hung a noose around Disney romance, watched its last breath kick the air while it hoped for some part of me to still believe that this paperweight heart could hold down a man. My mom did her best to never speak of its death, but there were moments she folded so easily, bookmark pages we were never meant to read, hard when it's written on goodnight kisses, wishing us ignorant for our future husband's sake, but for her sake too. And there were chapters we were torn between missing and hating you, but she wouldn't let us rip like that. Did her best to play dad, to play you dead, to plant a garden on your grave. It's not her fault she had to bury you alive. It's no wonder why. She loves so disoriented now. She spent our lives trying to figure out how to fit your footprint with her heels, how to make her mouth mock crescent moons until we'd be happy enough to forget you. But I still have this faded gray t-shirt you brought us back from a trip. It sits at the bottom of a drawer next to the last time I admitted any of this. And on some days, when I'm feeling particularly not like me, but more like a human okay with things less than perfect, I'll hold it to my face and pretend I remembered what you smelled like, that I knew who you were back then. All I know now is who we are because of your absence. Mom said that you loved us, made excuses for you. You excuse for a man. When I got my tattoos, I realized something you never did. Had to stick around for something you believe in, even when it hurts like hell. So I've been halfway embracing the next man who's been waiting in line for your place in my life, but I've been saving your space, anxious like going 60 in a 65, but I don't think you meant to park again. I think you meant to stay and drive. I'm sick of choking on your exhaust fumes when all I wanted was a goodbye and less awkward interactions with good guys. So this is my need poem. No, this is my I needed you poem. This is me showing you how I bleed a poem. I slice a finger, press it to the page, because I know that seeing my DNA splayed might be the closest I come to seeing you again. This is my ointment and moisture poem. A decade too long of cringing at words never meant to harm, of loving like dictionary, letting far too many find their definition in me for the chance that they'll stay. I'm giving your name away. So when I pray, I can call God dad without feeling that draft in my heart from the door you left open and unlocked. I don't remember the day that you left. I just remember the beginning of feeling unprotected and how at some point in this poem, I think I heard a door shut. Some part of me came home. KFI AM 640, more stimulating talk radio. Tim Conway Jr. here, and we do have news to get to. Do you remember? That do you consider the- words an art form? Yeah, I think people that are, are writers uh, and, and stand up comedians do that. But there are a lot of guys who are, are, are great and artists, you know, who, who do fantastic paintings. Then there's guys who do the abstract art and call that art. That's what this crap is. I'm sitting there in the theater watching this uh, Saving Private Ryan, and I don't know any actors for this reason. I want to b- believe when I go to the movie that they're they're really you know fighting in World War II, and I'm watching it, I'm watching, I'm watching, and I'm like, wait a minute, this guy from Cheers, what is he doing in the war? That's Ted Danson. Why why they connect? Why they uh, why is he in the war? I mean, who's next? The coach? Who else is in Cheers going to walk through uh, World War II for us? But it was um, yeah, it's a war where everybody knows your name. What was it about, like, you know, what was it accidental or what brought you to radio? Well, I, I was always more interested in radio than TV. My, my dad was on the Carol Burnett show for, you know, six, seven years. And I wanted to hang with my buddies. I'm 14 or 15. I wanted to go skateboarding, right? And people were like, wow, you have a you front row seat at the Carol Burnett show every, every week and you don't want to go? I said, well, it's not that I don't want to go. It's just I'd rather, you know, I was just getting into weed. <laughs> and you can't do that when you're at the Carol Burnett show. So, but whenever my dad would go to do like the Larry King show, I always jumped in the car and, and you know, even though it was four in the morning, he would go do Michael Jackson show. 
Hey, because I got to leave at 4.30 in the morning on a Saturday or Friday, whatever. I would jump in the car, go with him to, to do and just watch because I loved uh, radio. Two and a half billion wow. dollar budget annually for the sheriff's department. They have 18,347 employees. And um, I like every one of them. <laughs> so are comedians born or are they made? And how much of it was watching your dad and how much of it was, hey, I got to practice or do this, or are you just being you? Most of the stuff that we use on, on KFI and the radio show, I've gotten from the racetrack. And comedy comes from real desperate people, you know, people who don't, or putting everything on the line. Plus, my dad was, uh, you know, was uh, very funny growing up, never yelled at us, never, you know, raised his voice or swore at us. I remember um, coming home one night, my curfew was midnight in high school, which is pretty good. It's a pretty good uh, curfew. And I got in more, one morning around 6.30, 6.30 in the morning, shut the alarm off, snuck in bed, and my dad wakes me up at 9 a.m. And he says, what time did you get home last night? I said, I don't know, 12, 11.59-ish, around there. And he says, oh, okay. And he starts walking out. And he says, uh, you know, the LA Times gets delivered at 5.30 every morning. And he leaves, and I stop, and I go, wait, uh, what, what does that have to do with me? He goes, um, your, your car's parked on it. <laughs> if you're looking for yeah. an apartment, you got to call your dad, and you got to tell him exactly this, all right? Hey, Dad, right. I found this great apartment, but I just don't feel safe there. You know, I saw some creepy guys walking around. <laughs> Is there any way you could lend me a couple more bucks so I can get a nicer area? <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well, and when we do the show, uh, obviously we know that this, it'll stay out there forever, right? Uh, when, when you screw up here at the station and, you, and somebody sends an email saying, I want him off the air because he said this, this, and this, they take that email, paste it, you know, tape it on your door and say, good job. Yeah. Right, because somebody reacted mm -hmm. to what you, whether it's negative or positive, they reacted to it. And the guys that make the most money in radio have the most people who hate them. It's the Rush Limbaugh, Howard Stern, Michael Savage. You know all those guys. I mean, Michael Savage <clears throat> was is not allowed to go to Great Britain. He's on the do not enter list <laughs> in Great Britain because of what he said about uh, you know about the Brits. He's a radio guy. He just does radio. And yet he's on a terrorist list. That's how impactful it is. Hey, uh, I, my advice to you, young man, is never, ever, ever in your life get into drugs, okay? Okay. All right? We, okay. Pro we promise everybody on the air here you'll never do that, right? No, I'll never do it. Oh, excellent. All right. It's a bad, way. It's a bad road to go down. It's very easy to make somebody cry. It's very easy to make somebody mad but it's very tough to make them laugh. We get fan letters, mostly letters, uh, you know, the show sucks, you suck, uh, you're, you got your mom's sense of humor instead of your dad's. It's a whole run, right? Um, and, but we do get some letters saying, hey, I listen all the time, and those are nice. We always try to respond to them. But this is the only fan letter I've saved, and it was written on a Lowe's receipt. It says, uh, hi, Tim. At the time you came on KFI full-time, my husband... My best friend, love of my life, had a midlife crisis, and instead of buying a red sports car, he left me. We were married for 25 years. He left me for a woman who was 25 years younger than I am. I know that if I got through the day, that at 7 o'clock, you would make me laugh. You never let me down. My girlfriends would come by, make me shower, make me eat, and say, come on, Sandy, hang on. Tim Conway Jr. is on at 7, and he's going to make you laugh. Because you need to. You have to laugh. I can never thank you enough for just being you and Sandy from Seal Beach. But she was so paralyzed with heartbreak that she wasn't showering, she wasn't eating. Yet at 7 o'clock, she'd turn the radio on, and for three hours, while the, her problems wouldn't go away, they, they weren't as tough. They weren't as hard. And her friends would come over and make her shower and make her eat. Now, do you know how depressed you have to be to stop showering and stop eating? And they, their response was, you can make it, if you can make it till 7, he's going to make you laugh. And she said, I'd never let her down. That's pretty cool. That's the greatest fan letter I've ever gotten.
Can the spoken word be considered an art form? Absolutely it can. And just like martial arts, I believe that the spoken word can also be used as a weapon to heal and also to hurt. And it can also be one that draws our greatest strengths out of us as well. Like our, I, I believe that words really, you know, give everything around us value. You know, when our words are, are um, how should we say, calculated to, to edify or to give strength, we find that that's the energy that is, that is brought up in that. But when we have words that are literally meant to crush others, well, that's the energy that it creates as well. So do you think fists or words are more powerful? My philosophy is that the greatest martial artist, the greatest warrior, if you will, is the one who never has to throw a punch. And so if you can learn to command your words to create peace and to create balance and tranquility, you've got the strongest weapon. Because, you know, a word can settle all difficulties if you use them correctly. It seems that the more limited your vocabulary is, mm the more limited your life is. I think so too, and, and maybe just a minute, since we're in the martial arts museum, let's go back to a martial arts analogy. If all I know how to punch is do is punch, if, if punching is my only weapon, my options are limited. All I can really do then is stand toe to toe with you and exchange punches. And that's not really gonna get us anywhere. And just like words, if I have more tools in my arsenal, I have more options, more opportunities. So if I learn how to block, if I learn how to kick, if I learn how to redirect energy or force, if I learn how you know, to do a submission hold on you or a finger lock or any kind of a, anything, it doesn't even really matter the art, my options are expanded. And I think that that's very much the same with words. And the word that I find to be probably the most powerful, it's the word possibility because too many of us don't see it. But when we begin to recognize possibilities for ourselves, there's really no limit. Look for possibility, because possibility is what gives us all the powerful things in our life, you know? It's, it's not what's probable, it's what's possible, because when we see what's possible, we can make it probable. An art form can only be as good as its masters. God gave each of us the power to create our own words of art. Your words may not be quoted the world over like Martin Luther King Jr., but they may just mean the world to the person who hears them. Whether it's in theater, or whether it's in you know spoken word from a stage in the form of poetry, or whether it's in rap, or whether it's in oratorical skills, or whether it's in a homily or a sermon, or whether it's in a music song, I think the art form, the express spoken word or the art form of words, I think uh, is, is something to, uh, to, to hold dear. As a speaker, as a publisher, as an author, I think it's the highest form of art. I would say the highest form of art is, um, is what can be done with, with words. Not only do I think it's an art form, I think it is an art form that is not only so challenging to master, but those that do it, it's just like, those that do it well, it's just an honor to witness. We're the only created being in the order of this universe that has the ability to express ourselves in words that are intelligible. Not a tree, not a rat, not a fish, not a goat, not a lion, not a lamb. Humans. Make your life count by making your words count. Imagine the greatness your words of art can unleash. Words are dream makers or destiny breakers, and it's our choice. Never before in human history has it been easier to project our words to the world. In truth, we are all artists. What words of art are you going to leave behind? You know, there's so much power in the spoken word. You can experience that power, too. If only you'd buy my book and my CD, coming out this Saturday. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Walking down the sidewalk, kicking my feet as I'm moving to the music. Step to the beat, I woke up today. Oh, I got a snap. I got a snap. I got a snap. All right. Bobo! Yeah, you're yeah, right there. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today, um, the Lakers 
of effective immunity. We have relieved uh, Mike Brown of his coaching duties. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Well, you could have, you imagine it. what I could do with that hairline. I mean, man, look at that. So let's make it.